Uh, the topic today is the interest rate parity theory. Okay, this is what we finished up with last time in class. And our point and purpose in this lecture and in the next lecture is to talk about how exchange rates are, de are determined in a floating exchange rate system. We talked a little bit about how uh, we can think about two different major classes of participants in the foreign exchange market, traders, that is exporters and importers of goods and services, and investors, banks, financial institutions, investment companies, um, pension plans, insurance companies, and so forth and so on, who are trading assets on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, between the two, investors make up a bigger share, a bigger proportion of the foreign currency transactions that take place every day. And we're going to start today by talking about the interest rate parity theory, which is focusing on the behavior or the incentives of investors to invest in assets internationally. Now, we talked last time at the end about three different considerations that investors may well have in determining where they're going to invest other people's money, essentially. One is the rate of return, the rate of change or the increase or change in the value of the asset over a period of time. Second is the safety or riskiness of the assets in which they're investing, the likelihood or probability that they will or will not get the money back or that their expectations will be fulfilled or not. And the liquidity or the ability to convert their assets into a spendable form and to get access to the assets that they're holding or that somebody else is holding for them. Um, so those are three considerations, but we're going to focus our attention today on the first of these. And we're going to build up a very simple model that will help us understand how investors might, what they will need to consider if they're going to make an international investment versus making a purely domestic investment in a particular item. Okay, so let's get started with that. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to imagine a particular investment, uh, I'm sorry, investor, that has some principal amount that they're able and willing to invest in the security or asset markets. We're going to give them $1,000. We're going to call that P. The P stands for principal. So this is the principal that they're going to invest for a period of time. And we're going to imagine, just for simplicity, that that period of time is one year. So we don't have to mess around with, uh, we can do annual rates of return calculations. We don't have to mess around with time period considerations. Now, we're going to imagine that they can take that $1,000 and we're going to envision that there are two possible investments that the uh, investor can make. Number one, they can put it into a U.S. certificate of deposit. A CD is an instrument or a way in which banks will acquire deposits from um, depositors. And by guaranteeing that you will hold your money in a certificate of deposit for a period of time, say six months, say a year, say two years, the longer the period of time you commit yourself to, the higher the interest rate the bank will give you on that particular deposit because they know they're going to be able to hold on to it for a longer period of time and thus they can do more with your money in that, in that period. So, certificate of deposit, let's imagine that the CD is a one-year CD that they might invest in. Again, keeping the numbers nice and simple. And let's imagine that the interest rate on that particular CD is given by the variable I sub dollar. So I for interest rate, dollar for a U.S. dollar deposit in a U.S. bank. But let's imagine that the second alternative that this investor is considering is a certificate of deposit, but not issued by a U.S. bank, but one issued by a European bank, or let's say a British bank. So let's say they're thinking about putting their money alternatively into a U.K. certificate of deposit issued by a British bank. And let's imagine that the interest rate on that British deposit is I sub pound. Now, the naive way of considering this particular investment choice is to just compare the interest rates between the two countries and put your money in the certificate of deposit that gives you the higher interest rate. That would turn out to be the wrong way to make a consideration of how or where to invest. Because in investing in the British certificate of deposit, the rate of return is going to depend on some other factors, in particular the exchange rate and the changes in the exchange rate that will take place over the course of the year. Because when an investor deposits money in a certificate of deposit in Britain, they're going to have to go through some adjustments or changes. First of all, the CD in Britain is going to be denominated in pounds. And in order to deposit those pounds at a British bank, this investor is going to have to exchange their dollars for pounds 
are right before they're going to deposit it or purchase that CD in Britain. Okay? That exchange that's going to take place is going to have an exchange rate associated with it. Let's call it the E dollar per pound exchange rate, and let's assume that that value is the spot exchange rate that prevails today for an exchange of currencies dollar for pounds. Now, they take the pounds they acquire in that transaction with a bank. They take the pounds, purchase the certificate of deposit, let it sit in the British bank for a year. They earn their interest on that particular deposit, and then they bring it back at the end of the year. But in order to calculate how much your dollars, and we're starting with a dollar investment here, in order to know how much your dollars have changed in value, you're going to have to convert that back to dollars at the end of the year. And that means you're going to need to use the exchange rate that prevails one year from now to make that transaction. Now, what is the exchange rate between dollars and pounds one year from now? I don't know. Nobody knows. So, but if you're going to make an investment like this, you're going to have to make some guesses. You're going to have to form some expectations about what you think the value of the exchange rate will be because we were going to see that that's going to matter very much in affecting your rate of return on that particular investment. So I'm going to plug in a value here, and I'm going to call it E superscript little e, and the E up above now stands for expected exchange rate. The exchange rate in, in question is the dollar per pound exchange rate, and I'm envisioning that this is the one-year expected exchange rate that the investor is going to have to come up with a guess for in order to calculate the expected rate of return on this one-year British certificate of deposit. Now, let's step back and think about the rate of return on the U.S. dollar deposit. And here things are pretty straightforward, really quite simple. Because if you take $1,000 and put it into a CD for one year, and let's say, like I had done before, let's say the interest rate is something simple like, I don't know, 1%. Then at the end of the year, your deposit is going to be worth a thousand and what ten dollars, um, and if we calculate the rate of return on your investment, it's going to turn out to be exactly that one percent interest rate. So from this, we can use some different terminology, if you will, and identify that the rate of return on the dollar investment, from the perspective of a dollar holder, is going to be nothing more than the U.S. interest rate. Okay, so whatever that interest rate, that's what the rate of return that's expected. And it's a guarantee. There's no uncertainty. There's no guesses that have to be made. Put it in the bank. You're going to get that back at the end of the year. Okay, but if you're a UK, if you're going to invest your dollars in the UK deposit, you're going to have to go through the following exercise. And we're going to keep track of the changes in value. And in the process, we're going to create a formula that the investor could use to make determinations about rates of return on investments abroad. Okay, so first, let's start out with the principle. We're trying to calculate the rate of return on the British investment. We start out with the principle P, and to convert that to pounds, we're going to take this exchange rate, we're going to take the P, and we're going to divide by the dollar per pound exchange rate. Now, the P is in denominated in dollars, right? And if we take something in dollar terms and divide by dollars per pound, the dollars are going to cancel out, and we're going to be left with a variable that's measured in pounds. This is going to be the amount of pounds that the investor has to invest at the beginning of the year. Now, we take those pounds and we put them into the CD account and we hold them for a year. To get the value that's going to be returned at the end of the year, we're going to use a simple interest calculation. And simple interest is just we take the interest rate, we multiply it by the principal, and that's going to be the interest that's returned to us at the end of the year. The alternative, remember, is to do compounding, where like daily the um, interest get accrues upon the interest, and we earn interest on the interest that was earned, and there are formulas you can write out using exponents and so forth, and you can figure out what the exponential rate of return would be under alternatives. We don't need to do all of that complication. We're just going to use the simple interest calculation. So to do that, we're going to take this principle, P over E, and we're going to multiply it by 1 plus the British interest rate for the one-year period. 1 returns the principal to you at the end of the year. The interest rate times the principal P over E is going to give us the interest earnings that's going to accrue to this investor in pounds at the end of the year. All right, now, to keep this formula and to make it work later, you have to keep in mind that the interest rate that we're plugging into this formula has to be in decimal form. 
So if the interest rate is 1%, you're not going to plug in a 1 for I. You're going to plug in 0 0.01. Otherwise, your calculations are going to get all screwed up. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, this then is the amount of pounds that's returned to us or to this investor at the end of the year. To calculate how many dollars we're going to end up with, now we're going to have to apply the expected exchange rate. And to do that, we're going to take this quantity and we're going to multiply it by the expected dollar per pound exchange rate. That's going to now convert our pounds back into dollars a year from now. And this entire expression, P divided by the spot exchange rate times 1 plus the interest rate times the expected rate that will prevail a year from now, all together is going to give us the expected number of dollars that this investor is going to be holding on to at the end of the year. Okay? Now, to calculate the rate of return on the pound investment, which I'm going to write as ROR pound, what we need to do is to calculate the percentage change in the value of the asset during the course of the year. Now, we have the final value, or at least a formula for it, written here. We have the original value. What's the original value? P, the principal. So we take the final value, we subtract off the original value, which is P, and we divide it by the original value, which is P. The rate of return on the pound investment in a percentage term, I should say in decimal form, is going to be this expression. If we multiply it by 100, we're going to end up with it in percentage terms. So this is going to be now, you might want to, I will ignore this most of the time, but just to be complete, we might want to say this is the expected rate of return on the pound because the investor is going to have to plug in an expected value for the future exchange rate in order to make this work. All right. So that's our formula for the rate of return. And notice that it's now a function of or dependent on the exchange rate that prevails today, as well as the expected exchange rate tomorrow, as well as the interest rate that you're going to earn on that British deposit. Now, this is a little bit of a mess, so we're going to try to clean it up just a little bit. And one way to clean it up is to take note that the P up here is multiplied into this expression here, and it's over here. So I could factor out the P from this top part of the expression. And if I do that, I'm going to have P times 1 over E, 1 plus pound, times E, E minus 1. Take the P out. But then I'm going to have P divided by P. And principal over principal, whatever the value is, is going to reduce to 1. So I can get rid of the P entirely and now write this entire expression as, and I'm going to take some um, um, privilege and move this E, E on top of the expression over here. It's going to leave me with the following, EE e, dollars per pound divided by E, dollar per pound, times 1 plus the British interest rate on this CD, minus 1. And that becomes my formula for the expected rate of return on pounds. That's not obvious. It's not likely that anyone casually just thinking about it, you ask somebody on the street and say, suppose I put my money in a British CD for the year, how much money am I going to make? The interest rate is 5%, what will I get? It's unlikely that someone will say, well, it's going to depend on what the exchange rate is today, what it is tomorrow. We're going to have to plug it into the formula. It'll probably be EE over E times 1 plus the interest rate minus 1. That's what I would intuit from just the question. You wouldn't come up with that, right? And when you look at that expression, it's... You know, you got the elements in there. You know where it came from because I just walked you through the step-by-step. -step, but it's not very intuitive. It doesn't have a lot of intuitive meaning or understanding. So this happens a lot of times when we work with formulas and we try to derive them. And one of the things we'd like to be able to do is to find the intuition behind the formula. Can we make some better sense out of it? And we're going to do that. But in order to do that, we're going to plug in, we're going to do some manipulations of this particular formula. All right, so I'm going to write it again. Rate of return on the pound is equal to the expected exchange rate a year from now, divided by the spot rate today, times 1 plus the British interest rate, minus 1. 
Now, in the text, in the readings, you can walk through the step-by-step -step manipulations that have to be done in order to convert this into the formula that I'm going to write up next. I won't ask you to derive it. You won't have to do that. You can just take my word for it that the following expression will give us the exact same value as the expression that's written up above. And we're going to plug in some actual numbers and we're going to see that it actually works out that way. Okay, well this expression up here turns out to be exactly equivalent to the following. British interest rate out there in front plus the expected exchange rate, dollars per pound, minus the spot rate, dollars per pound, divided by the spot rate, dollars per pound. Oh, but that's not all. Plus the interest rate times the expected rate, dollars per pound, minus the spot, all divided by the spot. You may be surprised to know that the bottom expression, if we plug in the values for any EE, any E, and any I pound, is going to give me exactly the same value as the top expression. And you may well wish to ask, why do we need two of them if it's going to give us the same number? Well, we don't need two of them. But the second one actually is interpretable. It can give us some intuition. Because as we can see, the interest rate, we know that that's a part of the rate of return, and that was the rate of return on the dollar deposit itself. But there's more to it when we invest abroad, and here at the second expression, we can see that the rate of return is going to depend on this, this expression, which appears twice, EE e minus E over E. So my question for you is, what is that? What is EE e minus E over E? Percent change. It's a percentage change. Percentage change of what? Don't say the exchange rate, because there's two ways in which you can write the exchange rate, and no. it's not clear. No. Don't say pounds in terms of dollars either, although, no, yeah, okay, it is that. But it's the value of what? The value of which currency? Use that terminology. It's the value of the pound. So it's the percentage change in the value of the pound. When? In a year, in the next year, is that a guarantee? No. No, it's expected only. So, put all the terminology together, that middle expression there is the expected percentage change in the value of the pound during the course of the next year. If it's a positive value, what would we say the investor expects about the value of the pound? that the pound will appreciate in the, in the future. So if it's like 5%, then we'd say there's an expected 5% appreciation of the pound. If it's a negative value, then the investor clearly expects that the pound is going to depreciate in value over the course of the next year. So positive value, appreciation of the pound, negative depreciation of the pound. Now, that's something we can follow and track and make some sense out of. Now, the last thing to figure out, though, is why are there two of them? Why do we have an expected change in the value of the pound plus the interest rate times the same thing? And to get an answer to that, we kind of note that, wait a minute, I can factor out this complicated expression and write it like this. I pound plus one plus I pound times E E minus E over E, remembering what how I'm writing the expression E. E is written as the dollar per pound exchange rate. Don't forget about that. And in fact, if I'm going to use this formula with this currency or any other currencies, I'm going to have to remember that the formula was derived using the dollars in the numerator and the foreign currency in the denominator when we're investing with dollars. And if it's not given to you in exactly that form, you might need to do an adjustment and take the reciprocal. All right, well, written in this last form, which again is, ex is equivalent to this form in the middle, written in this last way, we can see that there's a principal plus interest component that we're multiplying into the EE e minus E over E. And that allows us to interpret this la these last two expressions and give, make some sense out of it. Your rate of return on the British deposit is going to depend in part on the change in the value of the British currency relative to the dollar. If the British pound goes up, then that's going to add to the rate of return on your investment in Britain. 
If it goes down, it's going to subtract from your rate of return on your investment in Britain. So all else equal, if you're going to invest in another country, what do you want to happen to that country's currency? You want to rise, to rise up while you are holding the foreign currency, especially if you plan to bring it back to your own home currency at some point in the future. <coughs> appreciation is going to add to your rate of return. Now, that appreciation of the pound is going to have two influences. First of all, the principal, the thousand dollars that the investor invests at the beginning, that principal is going to rise up in value by the increase in the value of the pound during the course of the year. So your principal of $1,000 is just automatically going to go up in value even if you got no interest on that particular deposit. Right? So let's say you just take $1,000, convert it to pounds, get whatever pounds you have, hold it for an entire year, no interest on it. It's just, it's just held in cash. You've just got pound currency in your pocket. But at the end of the year, let's say the pound goes up by 5%. Well, convert it back to dollars, guess what? You've got 5% more money than you did before in dollar terms. So just holding the principal in pounds, if the pound rises up in value, is going to increase the return on that, on that holding during the course of the year. So the first one times this is the increase in the value of your principal as a result of the change in the value, I should say the appreciation of the pound. If it's a depreciation, we would say it's the decrease in the value of your principal as a result of the depreciation of the pound, depending on if it's positive or negative. We change the terminology. Now, the last term is I pound times the expected change in the value of the pound. And that's taking note of the fact that the interest that you're earning is accruing to you in pounds during the course of the year. But those pounds relative to dollars, are changing their value during the year because of the change in the value of the pound relative to the dollar. So if the pound is going up in value, appreciating, then the interest earnings you're earning are going to go up in value along with the currency. And you're taking note of how much it goes up by multiplying the interest rate times the expected percentage change in the value of the pound. All right, so the reason for writing this formula in its somewhat more complicated looking form is because we can make sense of the various elements of it and provide some intuition as to what exactly is going on. Now, which of these formulas do you need to remember? Well, if you remember any of them at all, remember the second one. Because it's going to give you the final answer and it's going to allow you to offer interpretations of what is the source of your rate of return on a foreign investment with a simple interest kind of investment that you're taking place. So the second one is more important than the first one. But the first one is maybe worth remembering if only because if you need to calculate just what is the rate of return on a foreign investment and you want to do it really quickly and easily, well, each variable only shows up once in that top formula. You can plug the values in pretty quickly and easily. You can calculate the total rate of return. If you're not asked for any interpretation, you can get to the answer very quickly by using that first formula. So you might want to remember that formula too. We're going to put this together with some actual data. And we're going to plug in the numbers and we're going to kind of see how it works out in each of these two special circumstances, each of these two equations. So let's go to, I think we worked with this last week. We'll go back, and since we're talking about this in terms of the British pound, let's take a look at the British pound. And here, the way we're going to do the calculation is, since I don't want to make any guesses about what the pound dollar exchange rate is going to be, I don't really want to put myself in the position of a real investor. I'm going to play it safe, and we're going to step ourselves back in time one year. And we're going to ask ourselves, what has been the rate of return on a British investment if you were to have held it over the course of the last year. So we're going to kind of do an ex post evaluation of the rate of return that actually presented itself during the course of the last year between the US dollar and the British pound. All right, so to do that, we need two exchange rates. The expected exchange rate is going to be today's exchange rate. So write this down. The British pound exchange rate is, which way do you want to write it? Do you like the 0.76 or the 1.3? 
you're probably going to like the 1.3 because that's in the form in which the formula is in. It's in dollars per pound. So if I write it as 1.3, it's 1.3 dollars per pound. Right? Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Checking myself. So write that down. 1.30, let's make it, let's go to the third decimal, 1.302. So that's today's value of the British pound. And that's going to be the, the so-called expected rate because we're going back in time. Now let's go back in time one year. Okay. I did this calculation last time in class, I think. Go back a year, and the value of the British pound was 1.521. Dollars per pound. All right, so write that down. Take note of it. Now, interest rates. Here's the OECD, OECD data on short term interest rates. Um, anything less than a year is normally considered a short term investment. We're looking at just at that uh, borderline one year period. And I've got a few um, interest rate streams for different countries. Here, here's the UK right up here. And let's note that uh, the interest rate a year ago, let's see, September of 2015, uh, we're in October now, just about, doesn't matter, 0.57. So the interest rate I pound is going to be equal to 0.57%. So how do you write that as a decimal? Zero zero five seven point zero zero five seven is putting that into decimal form. 0.57 percent, not getting much interest. Holding on to. It. Notice the euro area here over over here though, and look at what our current uh, interest rates are. Minus 0.3 percent is the August interest rate in the euro area. Interest rates are negative in a lot of short-term deposits in quite a few countries today. Very unusual. What's the negative interest rate? That means you put $100 into the bank, and a year later you come back and they give you less money back. <laughs> Great deal, isn't it? Yeah. Why would you do that, right? Why would you do that? To encourage people to spend money? Well, no, why would you as a depositor do oh. that? Why would you put your money into a bank? Is there any way you can prevent it from losing money? What's your alternative to putting it in the bank and earning negative interest? Hold on to it. Hold on to it in what form? Cash. Cash, currency. So you could put just pounds in your pocket or euros in your pocket and just hold on to it. Is there any danger with doing that? What's the danger? It's a really large amount of money. Like a lot of like so, I, I have a garage. <laughs> it's stolen. Yeah. Ah, yes, it could be stolen. It might. You might have to worry about somebody taking it because you're holding it and you don't have a safety, pla a safe place for it. Or you might have to hide it somewhere so nobody knows you've got. It. And if it's a large amount of money, then you've got more concerns about that. So it might make sense for you to deposit it in the bank and even and lose a little bit of it so that it's safe and secure while it's being held in that bank. So that becomes the argument for why to hold something with a negative interest rate. All right, but well, we're not going to do that. We're going to do a simple case with Britain with a 0.57. Um, we might also want to compare this, and we will later, with uh, the United States. with the U.S. in here? Yeah. Okay, so write this down. A year ago, the U.S. short-term interest rate was 0.25%. I dollar is 0.0025. So if we just compare the interest rates between the two countries, it looks like, well, you get almost twice as much interest, although a pittance nonetheless, but almost twice as much interest from Britain with a 0.57 than you do from the U.S. at 0.25%. So it looks like you get a better return on your investment in Britain. But let's find out if that's actually true or actually was true during the course of the last year. All right, so to answer that, we're going to go back to the numbers. I'm going to need some help from you. I know many, many of you have calculators. So the rate of return on pounds can be written as, I'm going to do it with the first formula, the, uh, the, uh, the simple formula, if you will. The expected exchange rate is, what did we say it was? 1.30, right? 1.302. 1.302. The spot exchange rate is 1.521, plugging it into the formula. We're going to multiply that times 1 plus the British interest rate, which is 0 0.0057. We're going to subtract off 1. 
Could somebody please do that calculation for me quickly? And tell me what it is in decimal form, first of all. Anyone? Yeah. Um, I got negative 0.139. 139? Okay. That sounds about right. I think I did this before. So it's minus um, 0.139, or we could write that as a negative 13.9%. Negative, 13.9%. So you would have lost 13%, well, almost 14% of your money had you invested in the British pound over the course of the last year. All right, let's figure out exactly why. To do that, we're going to work out the second formula. The rate of return on pounds is equal to, first, the British interest rate, 0 0.0057. Second, it's equal to... Uh, 1.302 minus 1.521 divided by 1.521. And then plus 0 0.0057 also times 1.302 minus 1.521 divided by 1.521. Now, would somebody please do the middle calculation for me? This one right here. 1.302 divided by 1.521, and then set hit equal and minus 1. And that's going to give you the answer. So negative 0.14, and then round up to 4.0. Minus point 1440. 1440? 1, 4, 4, 0. 0. 1, 4, 0. 1, 4, 4. 3, 9, 8. 4. 1, 4, 4. 4. 1, 4, 4. Is that? Okay. Close enough. Okay. 0.144. So negative 14.4%. Take that 0.144 and multiply it by 0 0.0057. 0. 0. 82. 82. Okay. And then we've got the 0 0.0057 over here. Putting this in percentage terms, the first term is the interest you're getting on the British deposit, and you're making a great big hefty 0.57%. But principal is losing value because of what happened to the currency, uh, what happened to the value of the pound during the course of the last year? It depreciated, and it depreciated quite substantially by 14.4%. So the currency value dropped by 14.4%. Now, you also lost a little bit on your interest, but your interest was pretty uh, abysmal, uh, was pretty small to begin with. So and in total, you ended up losing 0.082% on your interest during the year, not a big loss. The big action is right here. You take the 14.4, you subtract off 0 0.57, 0 0.6 or so, and that's going to get you down to, oh, I got 14.4. It should be closer to 14.6. I guess there's another small amount being subtracted off. So, okay, somewhere close. So you're making a little bit of positive interest, but you're losing much more on the currency change during the course of the year. Contributing to, this should equal minus, oh, we wanted to get to 13.9, that's better. Minus 13.9%. Uh, no, that's not a clue. 13.9%. Okay, it's going to work out to be exactly the same value up here. Now, this goes to show how risky international investments could be. In order to do this comparison, we were sort of imagining that the risk and liquidity aspects of the investments, both here and abroad, were identical to each other. But what we're really seeing here is that they're not really identical to each other. Making a foreign investment in another currency is quite a bit riskier in a floating exchange rate system, for, sh for sure, because the currency can change against you in the currency that you're holding. And here is a perfect illustration of the fact but you may have thought you had a nice, good, safe investment in Britain, but a lot of the depreciation of the British pound that took place actually took place after the Brexit vote that took place in June. That was completely unexpected. Most observers thought that Brexit was, gonna, was not going to take place, that Britain would have stayed in the European Union. And had it stayed in the European Union, we wouldn't have seen such a decline in the currency value or the pound value during the course of the year. So making the wrong guess on the Brexit vote and coming up short meant 
that an investor would have been losing a pretty sizable amount of money on any British investment that was held by an American during that particular period of time, during the past year. And it mostly stems from the depreciation of the currency that was being held at the time. So now, let's go back a year and think about if you were a perfect foresighted investor and you made good guesses on the expected exchange rate, and you plugged in and thought, well, they're probably going to vote out of the European Union and the currency is going to fall. I'm going to guess that it's going to depreciate substantially. You would have then plugged it into your formula, calculated that the rate of return expected on the British pound is terrible. It's much better to invest in the rate of return on the dollar, which, based on what we had just said, was about 0.25%. So 0.25% actually turns out to be quite a bit of a better investment than investing in the British pound during the course of the year. Okay, any questions? Yes? How are these interest rates determined? Interest rates are determined on the market by kind of the supply and demand for short-term deposits. How many people want to borrow, how many people want to lend, how much money is available by banks to lend out. And so banks are actually setting the short-term rates. Now, how much they charge is going to be affected a lot by monetary policy being conducted by the central bank of a particular country. So they can control short-term interest rates through their expansion of the money supply, contraction of the money supply, and they can affect. So short-term rates are determined by banks, but they're affected in a big way by what the central bank does. Now, we generally will assume that central banks can control the interest rates up or down. So we're talking, for example, this past week about whether the Fed is going to raise up interest rates somewhat. If they do, what they're going to do is they're going to change their monetary policy in a way that tends to force the interest rates up in some, in some particular way or in a particular direction. So through the Fed's actions, they can control and affect what the short-term interest rate might be. So they have some control over it, and you might say they have pretty strong control over it and can actually raise it or lower it to some degree at will, but there's a lot of factors that can play a role in, in influencing it otherwise. Yeah? So do like individuals or banks, like for example with this example, would someone say, oh, I'm going to buy an investment in pounds now because I think that the currency will eventually appreciate or like normalize? Maybe. I mean, maybe you'd say, well, this is just a temporary adjustment. Maybe the pound value is going to go back up to where it was at the beginning of last or last year. You know, and if you believe that, then if you think that the exchange rate is going to reverse itself during the course of the next year, then the British pound is going to appreciate relative to the dollar. Now is a good time to invest in British assets. Because even with the small interest rate, you're going to get a much bigger boost because of the return by investing in a currency who's which is rising in value during the course of the next year. Now, this should start to help you realize why investment banks and big organizations, inst uh, financial institutions, they really would like to know what the exchange rate is going to be two months, three months, six months, a year out. They'd like to hire people who can run bad, you know, large macro models that can help predict what the exchange rate will be <coughs> because it's going to greatly influence investments and their portfolio values over the course of a year as exchange rates move up and down. You can also see that to pick a wise investment abroad, you're going to want to try to pick a currency whose value you think is likely to rise up in value during the year because that's going to contribute more to the rate of return on your particular investment. So. Appreciating currencies are what you're looking for in international investments. But if you guess wrong and you pick a currency that happens to depreciate maybe substantially more than you expected, then you can end up coming out as a loser. You could end up losing money like you would have been in an investment in Britain in the last year. Now, sometimes countries are facing bad economic conditions, and their currency is depreciating by a certain rate or at a certain speed because of kind of fundamental macroeconomic conditions within the country. But sometimes those same countries have very great borrowing needs. They need to finance their budget deficits, for example, and they need to draw in foreign investors 
in order to help finance budget deficits or spending priorities that they happen to have. Now, one way in which countries can overcome a depreciating currency is with a much higher interest rate. So you will see some countries in some periods where, even today, there are countries that have interest rates that are up in the teens. Russia is a good example of a country that has interest rates that are above 10, 15 percent. So you can go to Russia and you can invest in things there and earn a really respectable rate of return on that particular investment. But you might well suffer a depreciation of the ruble during the course of the year. But if you can get 15 percent on an investment or a deposit in Russia and the ruble only depreciates by, say, 10 percent during the course of the year, you still may come out ahead and make a nice, reasonable 5 percent return on that particular investment. So sometimes interest rates get bid up in the short term to compensate for the expectation in the financial market that your currency is losing its value over time and you need that higher interest rate in order to continue to draw in foreign funds. So that will happen and we can see examples of that in the data on a, on a fairly regular basis. Like I said, Russia is an example of that today. All right, now, what do we do with this? Well. What we're going to do is we're going to turn this simple example and this rate of return formula that we've now derived into a theory of exchange rate determination uh, based on investor behavior and decisions about how to invest money. So let's go back to our supply and demand diagram that we were using to depict the exchange rate in a floating exchange rate market. I'm going to put the quantity of pounds on this axis, the exchange rate between dollars and pounds on this axis. We've got an upward sloping um, supply curve for pounds, a downward sloping demand curve. And we've got an intersection. Let's call that E1, dollar per pound, and let's imagine that E1 and Q1 is the equilibrium exchange rate and quantity of currency traded in the foreign exchange market between dollars and pounds. Now, in the example we just did, looking back, we noted that the rate of return on pounds was very much less than the rate of return on dollars during the course of the past year. But what we're going to imagine, and I'm going to try to convince you of, is that what we really expect to see happen, because of investors' ability to move funds back and forth, and because the movement of those funds is going to affect the equilibrium exchange rate, we really expect that the rates of return on comparable assets in different locations will tend to become equalized. And that is what we call the interest rate parity condition. Interest rate parity, or IRP, is going to be the condition where the rate of return on dollars is exactly equal to the rate of return on pounds. And in a floating exchange rate system, that allows for the fact that perhaps one of the currencies is expected to appreciate or depreciate during the course of the year. Now, when I jump to this aggregate story now, we're talking about the entire market for pounds and dollars being traded by many different investors now, not just one person or one institution looking at a CD in the U.S. and a CD in Britain. Now we're going to be thinking about multiple investors, millions of investors maybe, that are making decisions about moving their assets from the U.S. to Britain and vice versa during the course of a day. And each of those days you've got people coming to the banks and saying, I want to trade my dollars for pounds, some, and the others are saying, I want to trade my pounds for dollars. Banks, as we said, are adjusting the, ex uh, the exchange rate in response to the supply and demand so as to equalize supply and demand and thereby maximize the, um, the fees that they're going to be able to collect on those trades. All of that is likely to lead to an equilibrium exchange rate in the floating market and also to interest rate parity. So what I'm going to do now is just start with the condition of interest rate parity. And I should also point out, when I write it like this, it's like saying we're assuming that the interest rate in the U.S. is equal to, plugging it in, EE over E times 1 plus the British interest rate minus 1, that that condition is satisfied. But wait a minute, what does it mean for that condition to be satisfied, really? 
Because now, if I'm thinking about this in the aggregate with lots of different investors, there's lots of different assets that could be purchased. And each of those assets have a different term structure, a different contract associated with them, a different interest rate. There isn't just one deposit that you can invest in in a country. There's many different types of assets you can buy with different interest rates associated with them, right? If you buy mortgages, you're going to get one interest rate. You invest in car loans, you're going to get a different interest rate. You put your money into a bank, you're going to get another interest rate. There's a whole collection of interest rates within a particular economy. And that's true of both countries. So when we say the interest rate in the U.S. now, what we're envisioning is kind of an average interest rate across all of these different types of assets which makes it conceptually okay, we can go forward with this, but in terms of trying to turn this theory into an actual, like we can measure it and see if it's true, we're, we're, we're gonna have a very difficult time trying to do that. The same thing is gonna be true for this expected exchange rate, because the expected exchange rate now is not just what one investor thinks might be true in the future, but it's what the average collection of sentiments are across a wide range of investors all of whom might have a different expectation about what they think the exchange rate will be in the future. So we talk about the expected exchange rate in the market, we're thinking of it as a kind of average. Again, an average that would be very difficult to figure out its true value at any particular point in time. Now, the same thing, the last thing is the exchange rate, E. Well, E is something you can actually pick up a paper and you could look at it. We saw the data for today. On, uh, on the internet diagram that I just showed you. You can find out exactly what E is, and that's a particular data point that's measured and recorded and reported each day. But the other things are not. Uh, it's supposed to be minus one at the end. All right, so keep that in mind. The reason it's not gonna matter for us conceptually is because what we're gonna imagine is we're gonna have this starting point, this idea that we're at interest rate parity but we're gonna assume that there's a small adjustment that takes place, a change in interest rates or a change in the sentiments of the investors that moves in a particular direction, and we're gonna ask, how would that change in sentiment affect the workings of the foreign exchange market and the ultimate exchange rate value? Okay, so let's walk our way through some exercises. Number one, uh, suppose, there is an increase in the U.S. average interest rate in the economy, increase in I dollar. Now, yesterday, interest rate parity prevailed. Today, you wake up and the Fed announces perhaps that they're going to raise interest rates. U.S. interest rates are going to go up, they're going to change monetary policy, and we can expect interest rates will rise. Banks respond by changing their short-term rates on certain things. Interest rates go up in the U.S. economy suddenly in the morning, and investors are aware and informed about that. They know it. Okay, well, here's what's going to happen. First of all, nothing has changed in the foreign exchange market yet. The immediate effect of this increase in interest rates is going to mean that the rate of return on dollars, which is the U.S. interest rate, is now going to become greater than the rate of return on pounds. Interest rate parity prevailed at first. Now there's a disequilibrium, if you will. Two are not equal to each other. Now we might ask, how would investors in the U.S. market and in the British market react to this bit of information? Well, the rate of return on dollars is now greater than pounds. We'd expect new money coming into the market that needs to be invested here or there, where is it going to be invested? More here than there, more in the U.S. than in Britain because of the favorable change in interest rates that's going to give a slightly higher yield that you can expect relative to investing in Britain. So this is going to lead to changes in the foreign exchange market, we imagine, because, because of the higher rate of return on dollar deposits, on average across all investors, that's going to lead to an increase in the demand for dollars on the foreign exchange market. Now what does that mean in terms of the supply and demand of pounds? So people want more dollars to invest in the higher returns here. Here we're measuring supply and demand of pounds. So what's going to happen to either supply or demand for pounds if the demand for dollars is going up? It's going to go down. 
accounts are down one seventy five percent. If you're demanding dollars, what you, what are you doing on the other side? Who demands dollars? British. British holders of pounds, or at least holders of pounds. So it's holders of pounds who are going to demand more dollars. What do they do then? They're going to supply more pounds to the market. It's going to be more people with pounds coming to the market saying, I want to get rid of my pounds, I want to get dollars instead, so I can take advantage of the higher interest rates on the deposits in the U.S. So the supply of pounds is going to go, what did I say? Up, right? At the same time, we can think about it from the vantage point of a U.S. dollar holder who was kind of indifferent between investing in a U.S. deposit or a British deposit yesterday. And because they were indifferent, some people invested in Britain yesterday, some people from Britain invested in the U.S. There was an exchange of currencies that was just enough to equalize given the exchange rate that prevailed on the market. So there was flows of currencies going back and forth yesterday. But now, with the tilt in favor of U.S. rate of return, U.S. dollar holders are going to want to get rid of their dollars less and would prefer to hold on more and invest in the U.S. So what is that going to do to the demand for pounds on the market by U.S. dollar holders? It's going to go down, right? So the demand for pounds is going to get pushed downward. So because of the favorable rate of return on dollars, Supply of pounds is going to go up, demand for pounds is going to go down. So let's shift the curves. Supply curve shifts outward and to the right, the S prime. Demand curve shifts leftward to D prime. And the equilibrium moves from point, let's say, S to point like T. So because of that change in supply and demands in the, in the currency market, uh, what's going to happen to the exchange rate, dollars per pound? It's got to go down. And if it goes down, what does that mean is happening to the value of the pound? Going down, it's appreciating. And what's happening to the dollar value? It is going up, appreciating. So now we've got a link in the model between a change in the interest rates that prevail in the economy in general and the effect on the currency value. And it's working our way through investors changing their activity, shifting where they're going to make their investments on a particular day in response to the changes in interest rates, thereby affecting the supply and demand conditions in the private market for currencies, thereby pushing the currency values upward and downward respectively. Almost the end of story except for the following. If we now go back and think about this formula right up here, what set this, motion, this action in motion was an increase on the left-hand side of the U.S. interest rate on average, right? So left-hand side of this increase causing the rate of return on dollars to go up. But now, as a result of investor behavior in the market, the exchange rate on the spot market today is going to go down. That means for investors calculating the rates of return tomorrow, they're going to plug in a lower spot rate on their exchange rate because the market was affected today and the exchange rate fell dollars per pound. But if this exchange rate goes down, and if, this is a big if, but we're going to make this big if, if the expected exchange rate that investors think is going to prevail a year from now hasn't changed at all, so regardless of the short-term effects, they still think the expected rate a year from now stays at the same level, and as long as there's no change in interest rates in Britain, and we're not going to change that unless we do it manually and tell you about it. So there's no change in those variables, but the exchange rate here goes down in the next day. What's going to happen to the rate of return calculated by investors on the next day? It's got to go up because this is in the denominator. A lower E is going to raise up the value, and so the effect of this is going to actually be to raise up the rate of return on pounds. And that's going to continue to happen until rate of return on pounds is exactly equal to the rate of return on dollars again. So interest rate parity is going to become the equilibrium final condition that will prevail under this story or under this mechanism.
All right. So that's story number one. And it looks really complicated, doesn't it? We've got all these things changing around, keeping track of every element and so forth. But now I want to step back from it for a second and just remind you that the story we're telling is incredibly simple. Because all we're really saying is investor behavior is affecting the exchange rate. If there's an increased demand for a particular country's currency, that's going to raise up the value of that country's currency. What we did in this exercise is suggest give an investor an excuse for wanting to demand more dollar assets. We said, what if the interest rates on US assets go up? And we're imposing the assumption ceteris paribus here. So ceteris paribus means leaving all the other variables that might affect investors' behavior constant. So it's like an experiment. What if the US interest rates went up and everything else stayed the same? How would it affect investors' behavior? And because their behavior is affected, how does it affect the foreign exchange market? How does it affect the currency value? And we work our way through that exercise. And all we found is that if interest rates go up in the US, makes US assets more attractive, guess what? The dollar appreciates. Because investors stream in and they buy more dollar assets. That's not very hard to understand, and it's not very surprising. And that's essentially the story we have just told in this very complicated looking way with supply and demand curves and rate of return formulas and so forth and so on. Now, I would be fine if in three months you forget all about the rate of return formulas, but you remember that if interest rates go up in the US, all else equal, that's going to tend to cause a dollar appreciation. That's not too hard to remember and keep that in mind first. And then when you do exercises that ask for more details like this, make sure that the answers you come up with here match the intuition. The intuition is pretty simple. All right, let's tell another story. Question? Well, I was just going to ask, like, what can you connect, like, since this is such like a topic right now for the Fed here, like, what makes a government or Fed like decide when they're going to to increase or decrease? Like interest rates? And what right, like I do that? that it appreciates or depreciates currency, but like what's the next, like what does that lead to? Like well, I mean, you know, monetary policy is going to have a lot of effects upon the functioning of the economy itself. And the Fed is, in our country at least, is not paying a whole lot of attention to what the influence would be on the exchange rate. Okay, the exchange rate will then have some influence upon balance of trade, have some influence upon borrowing and lending. It can have all of those effects. But the Fed is mostly trying to focus their attention on what does the interest rate need to be in order to maintain the rate of growth that we're achieving and to maybe stimulate it a little bit more. How do we keep unemployment low and, and keep it at this lower level that we've been able to achieve? So they're kind of looking at what do we need to do internally. Our focus in this class is going to be kind of how does it affect the exchange rate and then how does it affect trade patterns and, and influence, influence interactions with other countries. So it's generally not a central focus, but it becomes a central focus if a country decides to maintain a fixed exchange rate. Then they're turning their attention kind of from domestic matters, and they're going to try to control their economy in an alternative way, which is really to kind of control the exchange rate instead. And that's another mechanism that can be used. We'll talk about that in a couple of classes. All right, let's tell a couple of other stories here. Let's tell the following story, and I'm not even going to walk us through all of these mechanisms, but we could walk through all of these step by steps. Suppose another variable changed instead. Suppose there's an increase in British interest rates on average, ceteris paribus. What's going to happen to the value of the pound? Increase. You got the answer real quick. It's simple. There's not too much to it. Increase in the val and interest rates in Britain is going to cause the British pound to increase in value. Step by step, I would say something like increase in British interest rates is going to increase the rate of return, expected rate of return on British assets. That's going to lead investors to want to invest more in British assets, increasing the demand for British pounds on the foreign exchange market. That increase in demand for British pounds is going to cause an appreciation of the British currency. That's the mechanism through which the currency is going to change in the private market. All right, but let's tell one other story that is rather interesting. 
Again, I'll go back to a, a supply and demand diagram. All right, let's tell another story. This story starts with the following. Suppose there is an increase in the expected dollar per pound exchange rate. Increase in the expected dollar per pound exchange rate. So now this is a change that's not any real data that we're collecting in the, in the environment or in the, in the economy. This is sentiments. This is people's feelings, investors' feelings. Now, maybe based on information that they draw from their surroundings. They may read the newspapers, they may keep track of financials, they may look at the health of an economy, and they may use that to change their expectations of the future path of the exchange rate for the currencies in which they happen to be investing in. But when we change this exchange rate, this expected rate, I want to have some sense of what it means, how we can interpret it, and what kind of words we might use to describe it. I'm going to draw a number line, if you will, over here, a line. And on this line, I'm going to plot EE e minus E over E, also written as dollars per pound. I'm going to put a zero here. So up here is going to be positive values, and down here is going to be negative values. So what is, again, is EE e minus E over E? How do we interpret that? Percentage. Percentage change in value of the pound. Okay, so the percentage change in the value of the pound in terms of or with respect to the U.S. dollar. You could add that extra if you wanted to. Now, what's happened to the value of the pound in the course of the last year? Depreciated, right? So let's say we expect it last year to depreciate, and we're at some level below, our investors believe in general, that the pound is going to help depreciate in value, and that we're at some level below zero. So EE minus E over E to investors is negative. Now, suppose all of these investors on average suddenly experience a change in their beliefs, and EE, the term here, rises up in value. How would we describe the change in sentiment for investors. They expected a depreciation of the pound. What do they expect now? How do we describe it? EE goes up. Appreciation. Uh, depreciation, huh? Appreciation. Appreciation? Maybe not. Because an increase in EE is going to change the value that investors place from some level like this to, say, some level like this. It's going to go up. Maybe it won't go all the way up to here. It doesn't have to start appreciating. It just has to go up a little bit. So any increase in EE is going to move us from a value like this to some higher value along this line. Let's suppose it moves us from here to here. How would we describe that change? smaller depreciation. So investors expect a smaller depreciation than they did before. They expected the pound would depreciate, now they think it's going to depreciate a little bit less than before. All right? So that could be what EE means. Investors believe that depreciation will be less. But suppose they originally believed that the pound was going to appreciate in value and that you start at a point like this. Now there's an increase in EE. Which direction do we move on the line? Upward. Up. And what would an upward increase from here, how would we describe it? Increase in larger appreciation. Larger appreciation. Investors expect a larger appreciation of the pound to occur. So EE rising could mean either of those we could describe it in two different ways, depending on what the starting value is for the average investor in the economy. So that means I could throw you a question that says, suppose investors believe the pound will depreciate less than before. How would you analyze that? You've got to go back to the formula and think, oh, well, that means there's an increase in EE. 
EE is used in the formula in this particular way. Now I can work through and calculate what the effect of that is going to be. Now, there's an increase in EE. That's how we interpret it. But an increase in EE is going to have an effect upon the rate of return on pounds, right? Because the formula is EE over E times 1 plus I pound minus 1. If the expected exchange rate, dollars per pound, goes up, what happens to the rate of return on pounds? Goes up because the numerator term is rising in value. So the rate of return on pounds to the investor is going to go up. Let's go back to this term here. This is a situation. If an investor suddenly believes that the pound will appreciate by more than before, well, that's going to raise the rate of return, right? Because you're going to make even more money because the pound's going to appreciate more than before. That's a good thing. Now, what if they expected the pound to depreciate originally? Depreciation is going to eat up their earnings. It's going to take money away from them. But if they think it's going to depreciate less than before, it's going to eat up less of their earnings. Hence, raises their rate of return on the pound. It's going to be better for them if the pound depreciates less. So regardless of where you are on the line, an increase in EE is going to make pound investments more attractive. And in fact, because of the increase in the rate of return on pound, it's going to become greater than the rate of return on dollars initially because we impose the ceteris paribus assumption, no changes in the other parameters. Because of this, that's going to cause an increase in, let's see, increase in the rate of return on pounds. That's going to increase the demand for pounds, right? And it's going to decrease the supply of pounds in the market. The increase in demand for pounds is going to shift the demand curve outward to D prime. It's going to shift the supply curve inward to S prime. <coughs> And it's going to cause an increase in the exchange rate from E1 to E2. So the effect of all of this is going to be to raise up the spot exchange rate between dollars and pounds in equilibrium. Now, what we've got here is a case of what we might call self-fulfilling expectations. I don't know how to spell it. Self-fulfilling expectations because an increase in the expected exchange rate dollars per pound or an expectation that the pound will appreciate by more in the future, and if investors act on that particular belief, then the pound will actually start to appreciate today. Or if it was expected to depreciate in the future and they expect it to depreciate less, the pound will start to appreciate today, moving it in exactly that same direction. Now, where this becomes interesting or important is investors follow and track information on a day-to-day -day basis and they take that information in, they make determinations about how it's going to influence their investments and then they make decisions on those on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes the information is hard information, good information that's really reflective of the way in which the economy is working and it tells them good information about what they might expect in the near term. But sometimes the information is not very solid. It could be rumors or stories about what the Fed will or will not do in the future about interest rates. And if rumors spread that the Fed is going to do something tomorrow that's going to cause interest rates to change, which is then going to have an effect upon the exchange rate because we can plug it into our model and figure out what's going to happen. And we then act on that today. I heard a rumor. The Fed is going to do this. I better act on that. I'm going to change my investments. I'm going to invest more in British pounds because I expect the pounds going to appreciate more or whatever. And I act on that. Nothing might actually be happening at all at the Fed, but I've heard this rumor and investors act on it. Then it's actually going to have a real effect upon the market. It's going to expect values of investments. It's going to affect people in a particular way. Now tomorrow, they hear, oh, that rumor was misguided. No, that wasn't true at all. It really is not going to happen. So now they pull their money out and they move it in another direction. EE goes down tomorrow. Well, now the market is going to move down, the value is going to change, the 
point of this is that a lot of what happens in terms of returns and real returns for investors and for long-term savers and things like that might be a function of kind of the whimsical nature of, of investment decisions. Investors believe as a herd. They all move in one direction. Oh, something terrible is going to happen. They all start to move their funds out. They all have an, an economy can collapse because everybody believes or hears information that things are going to be bad. The market is going to drop. They all pull their funds out of the market. Guess what happens? The market drops. And you have a real effect upon real people all because of what could be just a rumor. And it could be false information. It might not be realized in the future. So this becomes a problem, potentially, for the way in which financial markets and currency markets work. Because we might not want to have that kind of whimsical behavior influencing the exchange rate that can have a real big effect upon what's going on in an economy. And that becomes an argument for why maybe it'd be nice to have just a fixed exchange rate. So that exchange rate can't be shifted around and be adjusted because of behaviors by investors like that. All right, those are the three variables that we can change in the model. Interest rates on the U.S., interest rates in Britain, expected exchange rate. We can work our way using the mechanics of the model now to identify how it's going to influence the currency value of the, of the countries involved. What I want to do next in the few minutes I have left is just talk a little bit about how we can expand the model to consider more things than what we've just concluded in the simple formula. The formula is very simple because all that's incorporated is the interest rate, really, and the expected exchange rate. We can kind of get a little bit of action out of those, those elements. But there's a lot more that affects investor behavior and decisions beyond just the interest rates and an expected exchange rate. And it's not too hard, given the basic gist of this model, to understand how these other elements will factor in. Now, we could do a very complicated exercise, and we could introduce risk and liquidity, and we can calculate maybe adjusted rates of return that incorporate the riskiness, come up with more complicated formulas that have more elements into it, and you can take some other classes and maybe learn about that if you're interested. But we don't really need to do all of that in order to understand the basic ideas of how exchange rates in a floating market might be affected by investor decisions. So let me give you a couple of additional stories. And now we're going to expand the model, if you will. And I'm going to be thinking about things that are not in my rate of return formula. But we're going to be using the same structure of investor behavior affecting exchange rates to tell these stories. So it's kind of a more complicated version of the model told in an ad hoc way rather than in a formal way like we've done with rates of return or in, in, um, interest rates. All right, the next thing that we can think about is risk of investments. Investment risks play a big role in decisions that investors make. Already we've seen that there really is a big risk of investing abroad rather than investing domestically. If you've got to change your currency into another dollars into another currency, you're going to have to worry about what the exchange rate is going to do during the course of the year, and that's going to affect the return on your investment. And if it moves in, the, in a way you don't expect, and if the currency you're holding drops in value, you may end up losing a lot of money because of the currency changes in a floating exchange rate system. So there's an automatic risk, what we call exchange rate risk, that arises by in investing in foreign um, assets. But there's a lot of other risks that can happen. What else can happen to your money abroad? What else might happen that um, is not incorporated in these formulas? Well, let me give you, yeah. A default. A default. What would that mean? Like the bank that you invest into can't pay you back. Okay, what if the bank goes, goes belly up? What if they default? What if they go bankrupt and they suddenly say, well, you know, we took all your deposits, but you know, now we don't really have the money to give it back to you. We're going to go into liquidation, we're going to have be taken over by somebody, and we're going to go through a long procedure, possibly, in order to determine who's going to get some of the money back and who's not, or what portion of it. So you might lose because there's a default on the, on the loan that you've made to somebody and they can't pay you back. So that's a real risk that can happen. Other risks involve some serious risk can happen because of political circumstances or situations within a country. One of the reasons why the U.S. is often viewed as a safe haven is because we've got a very solid and secure legal system. So if you invest in somebody and something in the United States 
and then a company goes bankrupt, for example, there's very strict procedures, and you can kind of know how it's going to get um, liquidated, what you can expect to happen as a result of that. There are systems in place that you know how it's going to work. There's a lot of different countries where you don't really know what's going to happen. Um, the legal system is not solid. You can't be guaranteed that the government is going to live up to obligations that businesses made or that they're going to come through or that the legal system is going to work in kind of a fair and objective fashion. And that poses a risk to investing in other countries if things go wrong. Another thing that can happen in some countries is that you might have a changeover in the political system itself. You might have a new leader come in. You may have invested in government bonds and lent a bunch of money at a certain interest rate. Government changes over. There's a coup. New leaders come in and they go, well, we're not going to honor the debt of our predecessors. You know, we didn't think that was appropriate. That's why we took over the country in the first place. So now we're not going to pay back any of the deposits, any of the loans that were made to us in the past. We're clearing the slate. Things like that have happened in the past. So you can make investments in other countries and you can suddenly have it, you can lose it entirely. Expropriation can take place. You might invest in a company abroad. You can start producing steel in a country somewhere else and everything is going well. You're pulling profits back. Government might come in and say, you know what? We're nationalizing the steel industry. We're taking all of your assets. We'll pay you a little bit of something, but nothing that you might expect as a true market or real value for your investments. Governments can come in and take over your assets. What if that happens? Big risk. You could lose a big investment as a result of that. Yeah. Is that what expropriation means? Takes over, yeah, and takes over your assets and claims it for yourself. Some countries have invested abroad, like Iran, for example, and then they get under the radar of countries that want them to change their behavior internally and say, if you don't change your behavior, we're going to freeze your assets. So assets get frozen abroad, and then they can't retrieve them and they can't pull them back. That's losing the liquidity of those investments and it makes them riskier. If you expect the risk of investment to be changing, if the investment climate is changing and becoming riskier, what should happen to the currency value in that country, do you think? Well, it should fall, right? So anything where assets become more risky, if the risk of appropriation goes up, if there's a coup and the government is changing over and you don't know how things are going to be handled, whether contracts will be honored in the future, any kind of change in the political atmosphere then can change the assessment of risk in that particular country and anything that makes a country look riskier is going to cause people to pull their investments out. Britain decides they're going to leave the European Union. What's the effect going to be? Answer? I don't know. I've got investments in Britain. Are they safe? Answer? I don't know. Maybe I'll pull my money out of Britain because I don't know what exactly is going to happen and the risks are now suddenly higher than they were before. So risk can affect your decisions and can affect the value of the exchange rates in a similar way to changes in interest rates can change. Stock market values go up and down in different countries, right? If you see a stock market booming and market values are going up, you can invest in, ride it up, make a lot of money. So if you see stock markets rising, that might draw a bunch of funds in. And if the funds draw in to take advantage of the market rising, what's going to happen to the currency value in that country? It's going to go up in value because investors will stream in to take advantage of the higher rates of return that can be expected on stocks. Stock prices rising are not an interest rate. So it's not technically in our formula, but it works in exactly the same way in the model. So investors have a much broader set of concerns. They care about rates of return, not just on interest-bearing deposits, but also on real estate and also on stocks and bonds and so forth. They care about risk. They care about liquidity.